I've heard nothing but great stuff about Clive's first talk. His second talk will be on fluid dynamics uh, and the cerebrospinal fluid as it relates to CCSVI. Now, uh, sadly, since we last met, nobody has given me a, a multi-million pound deal for my knowledge. I've got no book reviews, so sadly, I have nothing financial to disclose at all. But I am open to offers. I'm now going to look at the other fluid in the brain, or in the intracranial space, which is cerebrospinal fluid. And uh, as Dr. Slifoni said, um, this is actually what I talk to my students. I, I tell them, what is cerebrospinal fluid? What is blood plasma? What is lymphatic fluid? It's all water with the technical term in my lessons is stuff in it. So it's all water with stuff. And the trouble is that so many people get hung up on the stuff without actually looking at the dynamics of the water, dynamics of the cerebrospinal fluid. So that's what I'm going to be looking at here. Now, I actually have to thank Mark Hackey for what he's put up. Uh, the, the, if I'd had my hands on that data, this talk would be different because I didn't have that data. I've had to use uh, other data. But you'll see the principles. They fit very closely together. Right. The very first thing is there was one study done by Paolo Zamboni and Robert um, Zivadnov uh, with patients from Buffalo. And when I saw this study, I instantly saw that the cerebrospinal fluid dynamics had changed. Now, I'm going to go again and show you in very simple terms. What we have here is, in this study, they measured the flow in the aqueduct of Sylvius, which is between the third and fourth ventricles. And what they found that during systole, there, in both cohorts, the healthy individuals and the MS patients, they found that the blood flow, sorry, the cerebrospinal fluid flow was 32 cubic millimeters per heartbeat. In other words, technically, that's from there to there. Right? Got that? From there to there. You can see when I give lectures, I do an awful lot of this, right? In the healthy controls, when you went to diastole, it went back to 19.3, the flow in the other direction. So we've gone from here to here, and then it goes back to here. The difference being important, but we'll come back to that. Whereas in the multiple sclerosis patients in diastole, it went from here to here in systole, and then from here to here, or in fact a little bit back in diastole. In other words, no net flow of the bulk flow of the cerebrospinal fluid from the choroid plexus. To get a bulk flow, you've got to have a little bit of a shortfall on each heartbeat. And that, in systole, back to diastole, that difference is your bulk flow. As soon as I saw that, I knew that something was different in these patients. We come back to my square brain. And uh, here's just some figures for your, uh, to help you. You've got about 500 to 700 milliliters per day of cerebrospinal fluid produced in the choroid plexus, passing through, going passing through and passing through the arachnoid villi here into the sagittal sinus. There's also something else going on, but we'll talk about that in a minute. A very slow perfusion through here. Now... The point is that various people have researched this and studied this, and what they found is it's this pressure drop across the arachnoid villi that dictates whether this thing flows or not, whether you get any bulk flow. So this is all pointing to a lack of a pressure drop between there and pointing to venous hypertension. So we've got a completely different route now pointing to the same thing. And you can see what you need for flow is you need this pressure drop. In fact, more correctly, you need a pressure drop from here to here. If you have venous hypertension here, which we've seen, and we, I'm going to say it's fact. There's no conjecture about it. Then if that goes up, unless this goes up in pressure, then you will get a reduction in the flow across there. And this is what seems to have happened in this situation. 
you can see, again, the healthy individual, the, the CCSVI patient. This re increases here. This was 10. Now there's no pressure drop, so the fluid is not going to flow. But of course, we've got a question mark here. Do we actually get raised cerebrospinal fluid pressure here, causing a raised intracranial pressure? Well, the evidence from that first slide is that you don't, and as we know in MS, they don't seem to have a raised intracranial pressure. Because if you had a raised, if this raised as well, then you would still get some flow. Now, I'm not going to rule that out. I think more work needs to be done on that. You may get a moderate increase, which doesn't class classify as, uh, as raised intracranial uh, uh, pressure, but, but it may be enough to just keep some flow going through, so you've got a kind of minimal flow of going across. But all the evidence is pointed to the same thing, that basically the pressure drop, which is applied to the cerebrospinal fluid, has reduced, therefore the ve venous flow has gone, uh, so the flow of the cerebrospinal fluid, the bolt flow, has reduced. In other words, more evidence of venous hypertension. And as far as I'm concerned, it's a cut and dry case. You'll see the next bit of data later on, which will show this as well. And, 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 and Robert Zavadnath is working on this, so we're involved in it. And we're seeing exactly the same thing occurring again. So now we're getting consistent pictures from several sources. Now I'm going to come to what, as a mechanical engineer, I love. This is a complex system. This is interesting. This is how the brain manages to regulate the the blood flow and doesn't explode basically. I'm going to show you here. This is what I call the hydrodynamic regulatory system, right? Intracranial hydrodynamic regulatory system. What we have here, well, let me just explain. I'm going to stand just here. I'm carrying my own pump. You can't see it. It's called my heart. And I'm going to annoy all the clinicians here by saying it's a one cylinder pump. And of course, you know that there's more than one cylinder in the heart. But actually, the one that delivers is the left ventricle. And what it's doing, as I'm talking, it's squeezing this muscle squeezing, delivering a big slug of blood that goes up the aorta and up the carotid artery, heading towards my brain. Now, in this soft tissue, no problem. It's got a lot of compliance. It can give. The volume can give. When we come to here, hard tissue, hard cranium, bit of a problem. If we have that increased blood going in there, that will start to increase the shear forces on the capillary bed and also compress the parenchyma. It will do all sorts of destructive damage. Um, I'm saying that absolutely confidently, having done no experiments in it, but all the texts that I read say that. But but just makes sense. You'd have greater shear stresses on, this, on the endothelia and you'll get greater compressious, compressive forces. So it would seem that it would likely to happen. Let's look and see how the brain deals with that. Here we have some pulsatile blood, arterial blood, and that is a real signal that I took from uh, some patient's data. And as it comes up here, when it goes through the capillary bed, it's smooth, non-pulsatile in young, healthy adults. As you get older, it becomes more pulsatile, and I, I suspect that causes more vascular damage. As you move back down here, however, it once again becomes pulsatile, although not as peaky. So it's flattened out. In fact, it's operating as what we call in the trade as a second order low pass filter. What's actually happening is that the energy, there's a Vinkessel mechanism here. And what a Vinkessel mechanism is, if you think about an old fire pump from the Victorian era, where in the 19th century, where the kind of guy turned the handle, but the actual flow out of the nozzle was completely smooth. And yet, as the pump went round, you'd think it would be going, coming out in spurts. Well, what happened is it has a vessel that fills up in, dia in systole with the excess water, and then in diastole, it puts it back. So you get a smooth flow. So you get smooth flow through the vascular bed. But what happens is you've got to have expansion of the vessel, volumetric increase. And when that volumetric increases in the arteries as they pass through the subarachnoid space, it displaces cerebrospinal fluid through the forum and magnum. It also has an effect on the aqueduct of silvers, silvius. And then that energy is put back into the veins here by compression of the cortical bridging veins, so the Stalin resistors there. 
Here we see another slide. I'm borrowing other people's uh, uh, text here, diagrams, um, breaking all the copyright laws, but no, who, who, who matters? Here you can see the pressure here, where it's at its greatest, the pulse wave sent into the cerebrospinal fluid and comes back here to the Stalin resistor where it gets compressed. And I say a Stalin resistor, it's, everyone calls it a Stalin resistor, but it isn't a Stalin resistor. Again, it's, it, I would say a quasi Stalin resistor, but I'm just going to use it because it actually has a sphincter here that kind of tightens up. And what happens is, as the smooth blood flow gets into here, it builds up pressure, builds up pressure until the transmural pressure is great enough and then it just goes and just lets that pulse back into the sagittal sinus. And then it collapses as well because there's actually a pulse going this way. So you're in a complex relationship with a pulse here and the pressure growing up here. And I've just done a paper that I'm not going to share the details with this, which I put into a, a journal, which hopefully we might get published, which should show a model, a mathematical model of that, which I'm uh, quite proud of. But I think we have a reasonable understanding of that now. Now we come to what the data that I crave and want and the stuff that Mark's doing and, and I am hoping that we can get more of. There is no data out here other than the stuff that Mark has and it's not in the public domain for MS patients. So my, my kind of philosophy is work on healthy adults, understand what's going on in the normal physiology, then apply it to a pathology. So we're looking at normal physiology here. So this is some data that was published by Ambarki. I call it a full hand of data. In other words, I've got over a cardiac cycle, I've got the, the arterial pulse. So systole here, I'm starting to peak systole with this. We've got the venous pulse in the jugular veins, and it's really a slice through the cervix here. I've got the um, cerebrospinal fluid through the cervix, through the forum and magnum. And then I've got the arterial uh, the aqueducts of Sylvius flow here. I've multiplied that by 10 because it's much smaller and you wouldn't see it otherwise, the actual sign here. You can see it's a sinusoidal wave. Also, one of the things here, we're into vector, linear algebra and vector, uh, vectors. It's the directions and it gets very confusing. I put these in the same direction here. You often see them reversed. This, I've, again, this is, at that point, is actually flow out of the cranium, but again, for what I'm trying to show here, it's better that I put it this way. So what you see is you get a peak here in a normal person. The peak is transferred to the peak in the cerebrospinal fluid. So you get peak flow out of the forum of magnum there. And then that's transferred sometime later back to the, uh, the venous flow. Notice that they swap over. At this point, the blood coming into the cranium is greater than that leaving it. So we've got more blood coming in. So there's a rate of change of the blood increase in the cranium. At these points here, it swaps over in diastole. You've got the blood leaving the cranium is greater than the blood entering it. So in other words, it start, the mass of blood, the volume of blood is decreasing. And what we've been looking at is building volumetric models of this. And the way we do this is we have to integrate those signals to get the volume, instantaneous volume changes. Now, unfortunately, I have to do a little bit of maths here just so you get the idea. But don't worry about it. You've got a constant intracranial volume. So you can make, up the, 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 make it up of whatever you want. But if you put in some more arterial blood, you've got to take out some more venous blood or some more cerebrospinal fluid. This is the brain parachyma, which is supposedly not allowed to change volume. It does change volume. The, the Kelly Monroe hypothesis is not quite correct in this sense. We'll see about that later on. There are minute changes, but I suspect in your MS patients, you're getting bigger than normal changes. But I can't prove it. And when I looked at Mark's data earlier on, I was absolutely convinced that some very strange things are going on here, and it will be affecting that. I call it the intracranial fluid volume change. So in other words, I'm integrating this. So what I've got is the arterial minus the venous that flows, that's the blood flows, minus the cerebrospinal fluid gives me this. So if this is greater than this difference, this is negative. If this is greater than that, that's positive. And we call that function there, the arterial minus the venous, minus the, venous the craniospinal system volume change. It's the blood volume change. Simple as that. When that's negative, in other words, that leaving the cranium is greater than the blood entering it, well that leaves me with only one option, the parachyma must be expanding. 
It's being stretched. It's under tensile stressing. Yeah. Now, I put this in a recent paper that I put into uh, the Journal of Cerebral Blood Flow and Metabolism and got absolutely crucified for saying that. Uh, so there's a lot of people there who don't understand this, but I'm sorry, I know it's right. The physics tells me, the maths tells me this. Conversely, when this is positive, then the brain parenchyma is being compressed. And what I'm going to explain in a minute is how the ventricles move from this. Now, what I've done here is I've integrated these. So these are the integrated signals. So these are the instantaneous volumetric changes. And you can see here that this is the difference between the arterial and the venous. And this is driving the whole system. You get the signal here. Look at the signal for the cerebrospinal fluid leaving th the cranium through the forum of magnum. It's a very similar shape. It crosses over here. But certainly through systole, it's been led and driven by the change in the blood volume. In other words, the message to get here, and a very, very important message, is the change in the blood volume in the cranium, which is driving all the motion of the cerebrospinal fluid. But even more importantly, that's the difference here between the arterial and the venous. In other words, the venous is equally important as the arterial. So any change in the venous signal, any change in the venous pulse, is the clue to the changes that are going to go on. There's, this is the intracranial um, fluid volume change here. And you can see it becomes negative at that point. So in other words, the brain is under tensile stress. It's the parenchyma is being stretched at that point. Whereas here, it's being compressed through this part of the cycle. Now, we see this in all the healthy individuals that I've looked at, the data sets that I've looked at. We see a similar picture. I'm adding a little bit of extra in here. That's where the cortical bridging veins are compressed there. That's where they ex uh, so that's where they're being compressed here during systole. And that's where they expand, building up pressure before they discharge in diastole. And um, you see this healthy picture anyway. That's a healthy individual. Let's look at, I think, I, I think I've explained all this here. What I want to say is that it's a finely tuned mechanism. Just like your car, if the tuning goes out, everything goes wrong. And that's clearly what's happening in the data that Mark presented earlier on. The motion of the blood, and the venous in particular, dictates the motion of the cerebrospinal fluid. So consequently, any change in the venous pulse is going to change, and the dynamics of the venous system is going to change the cerebrospinal fluid pulse. And ultimately, that may change the pulsatility of the flow through the cerebral bed, which could account for the uh, changes in the, um, in the endothelial changes that we're seeing influencing blood flow. So the whole thing is linked. Right, so there's not many data sets that are out in the public domain. Remember, I'm going back to my Einstein analogy. Einstein just used a pencil and paper or the equivalent of a laptop and thought about other people's data. All I, use, all I do is the same. I don't take measurements. I don't treat patients. I just think about data. So I can only use what other people give me. And if anyone's got data sets, I will happily use them, I can assure you. And, and also, I get criticized by referees who say, well, you've used someone else's data. Well, if it was good enough for someone else, it's good enough for me to use. I can't see the point. But um, you know, I'm not going to give up. We'll get there in the end. Now, I did manage to find one set of, comp of data here with the arterial venous and cerebrospinal fluid through the forum of magnum. For, um, it was published by Al Alperin in a small paper, and it was described a patient with head trauma. I know nothing else about this patient. It's not described. He did some analysis of this. So his analysis is different to mine. But um, he said there's something different going on, but he could not explain it. Um, my analysis, I think, can explain some of the things that are going on here. Let's look and see what's different. First of all, we see instantly that the peak between the arterial and the venous is short, very short. In other words, that means that this brain, the intracranial cavity, the whole thing, has lost its compliance. The signal is being taken straight from one place to the next. In other words, the compliance is reduced. Things aren't moving like they should do. Secondly, this is much more pulsatile here. This is way, oh, the signal's almost as high in, in, in systole as, as the arterial signal. And in diastole, it follows it almost exactly. This is highly abnormal. 
And of course, that means there's hardly any difference between the two signals in the difference between the arterial and the venous pulse. So consequently, the cerebrospinal fluid pulse is very, very flat. When we integrate this to show the volumetric change, you get that. I want to show you the healthy person again, just to show you it. Look at the healthy thing, a sine wave here. Look how this drives the, the red signal here, the difference between the arterial and venous, drives the cerebrospinal fluid signal there. Look how it follows it. In this patient, there's just no correlation. Well, there's hardly any correlation. It's completely different. This signal is following the, the, the other signal. This, there's something very, very wrong here. Something is wrong. Now, I'm not a neurological specialist. I, uh, I, I look at data sets. I look at fluid mechanics. And I try and pick up as much information as I can from clinicians and the like. So I searched around to try and figure out whether, if I could see anything in the text that might give a clue, and I found this. I want to just show you, um, just note two things. Note how close these two things here, the peak goes up, and this comes up and follows it here, does that. And here, this goes up, and then the red line comes down negative at this point, and then goes back positive. And I found this in one of Bateman's papers, um, and Bateman didn't give the data, didn't give the cerebrospinal fluid data, didn't give the data over the whole cardiac cycle, but you can see you get a very similar type of arrangement here, and you're seeing a similar thing here. And this was for a patient who had uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus. So I would suggest, I was just on the side, I would suggest that this patient with head trauma probably has something akin to this going on here. But what I'm saying here is from the signal and how the signals change, you can tell an awful lot about what's going on. And unfortunately, nobody's done it for MS yet. So we, we, we need to look at these signals. Now I want to look at leukariosis because one of the things is if this whole system, the tuning, is going out and changing, then that is a good chance that the pulsatility of the blood going through the vascular bed is changing. And that will induce changes, maybe morphological changes in the tissue, in the endothelia, which may explain some of the things we've observed. There is a lot of similarities between leukariosis and MS. People have noted, histopathologists have, no, have noted this when they've examined the brains of patients who've had uh, both conditions. There's no conditions data on pulsatility in the fluid bed for MS because, as you know, uh, up until two, three years ago, there was no hint that MS might have a vascular basis. So no one's done the work. But... Bateman did the work on some work on uh, patients with leukariosis, and it's very intriguing. Let's just look at this here. Here we have the normal data up here, and here. Here we have, these are classified as patients with leukariosis, one, two, and three, and in, in increasing severity as you go down there. And here's a normal pressure hydrocephalus patient as well, or average group of patients. You can see instantly that the blood flow has reduced, the cerebral blood flow has reduced in the brain, in the leukariosis patients, not unsimilar to what we see in the, in the MS patients. These are elderly patients on the whole, so their compliance of their arteries is probably not so good, so it's not surprising that the arterial pulse is increased, and there's a, a more pulsatile signal there. And that doesn't surprise me that we've got increased pulsatility in the cerebrospinal fluid there. The interesting thing is when you look at the venous data, you can see that the pulsatility of the sagittal sinus has increased dramatically compared to the controls in the leukariosis patients, and also in the straight sinus, which is very interesting, but not in the cortical veins. And I suspect they're actually doing not the bridging veins there, they're actually doing the cortical veins. So what this is telling me is that this pulsatility that's going through into the system is being transferred preferentially into the deep venous system and maybe being transferred after the cortical bridging veins into the sagittal sinus, but is not being transferred into the cortical veins. In other words, something has changed in the, way, in the routine of the way this whole system is behaving. I suspect the impulsatility is increased there because of the increased pulsatility of the cerebrospinal fluid affecting the starling, starling resistors and also the arachnoid villi. So 
there's something changing there. I would love to see that data being replicated for MS patients. I suspect you'd see some similarities there. Notice that there are some changes, as we saw with a normal pressure hydrocephalus patient, they've got a much less pulse style flow. So again, getting that data would be extremely helpful. So I can safely say that if you have um, venous hypertension, you're going to alter the pulse. You're going to alter the behavior of that system. And it's going to alter the tuning of the whole system. We come back to Moya. Remember, they increased the, they compressed the neck and they found intracranial pressure, the, the cerebrospinal fluid to greatly increase. I suspect that this is not happening in the MS patients. I don't know why, but uh, I suspect there may be a slight increase, but it's not as great as uh, in those patients. But again, we, we, I, I'm absolutely convinced that what we have is increased blood volume in the um, cerebral veins. And um, that is going to can pr actually expand those vessels. And that's going to change, put pressure, you know, you expand something, then something else has got to give. So that'll change the signal. So again, there's lots of evidence to suggest that the venous hypertension is going to change the dynamics of the whole system. Now I'm going to come on to this. I'm not presenting the data that, uh, that Robert and myself um, have been involved in, the work that we've been involved in. Robert alluded to it earlier on. Um, but when he posed the question to me, I've got this changes in the cerebral spinal flow characteristics in the aqueduct of Sylvius. What's going on? Can you explain? Uh, that got me thinking about this whole thing, and I started to do some mathematical modeling. And in fact, my thinking has improved and come on since then, as, I, as you will see. So I'm going to concentrate, because there is some data about flow in the aqueduct of Sylvius. Now, I have to say, I would prefer to see data for the actual across the cervical flow, but this is also helpful. It tells us something. I've already gone into this to say that this suggests to me that you've got reduced bulk flow. And I dug up the only other source that I could find in the public domain, which was ca uh, came out of Buffalo on a poster, uh, which Robert will be aware of, shows exactly the same thing here. We can see that the net flow in the MS patients, the bulk flow is reduced compared to the controls. Clear venous hypertension and suggesting that while the, um, there might be a slight moderate rise in the intracranial pressure, uh, it's not too great. What we also see is that the flow, the positivity of this flow has increased in the MS patients compared with the controls. And this tells me, suggests to me that something's happening with the ventricles, as I'll explain. Now I'm putting the other signal in here. And remember this is multiplied by 10. I put the aqueduct of Sylvius um, signal in here. The timing is crucial. What you've got to realize is that the pressure in this part here in the brain, the brain is under negative pressure because the cerebrospinal fluid out is going out more than the blood coming in. So in other words, the whole brain is under tensile stresses, expanding. And what happens when that happens is the ventricles start to collapse. And as they collapse, they push cerebrospinal fluid out. So as we come as this goes down in this situation, the flow in the aqueduct of Sylvius increases to a peak, which is exactly at the point where the cerebrospinal fluid in the, across the cervix changes direction. Again, we're talking rates of change here in every case. You see exactly the same thing on the other side. Well, you don't. It doesn't quite add up, but it's pretty close at that point. Those are the two <laughs> crucial points. And there, we're getting the opposite. We're getting dilation as the flow comes back, compressing the vein. It opens up in that point. And the flow goes back to the, to the aqueduct of Sylvius. So again, the timing of the circuit is hugely important. Now we know, that made me thinking that there must be a connection between ventricle size and the flow in the aqueduct of Sylvius. And we know that many patients with MS have enlarged lateral ventricles. Again, there is hardly any data out there in the public domain. But I found Zhu's paper, which is extremely helpful. He had this paper for um, at which he looked at normal individuals, then other individuals with various pathologies. Now, look, when I show you this data, what you've got to realize, I spent hours in my office 
taking PDFs of these things, blowing them up, and then taking the data off by hand on these graphs that people do that as accurate as I can, which takes me absolutely hours to do one of these things. And, uh, and again, I had to do this with all this data. Now, there may be slight inaccuracies, but I'm not that far out. It, it stacks up. What you see instantly is when you, do an, when you look at the lateral ventricles, this is my analysis, not Zoo's analysis of their data. When you do a correlation, you see that there's actually R squared is 0.8. In other words, there's a very, very strong correlation between the aqueductal flow and the, um, the ventricle size. He's got the area. I assume, again, it's my own ignorance, but I assume that's actually just the area on the MRI um, pictures. I've lost this here, but you can see what I've got there. Um, if we go to the lower, the lower um, graph, you can see the lower plot. You see that something's different. This is described in the paper as a neurologically normal subject with increased ventricle size and increased pulsatility in the aqueducts of Sylvius. In other words, a lot of that describes much which we see in MS patients. Increased ventricle size, increased flow in the aqueducts of Sylvius. And we see this open loop. When I see that signal, that tells me I've got a phase shift in the signal. Basically, the signal, the sinusoidal signal, has shifted. So what I did was, what I did, you know, I've been a, an engineer, what I do, very practical, all I do is get it into a spreadsheet, take out the top of the, of the data set, stick it at the bottom, shift it up, align the two signals up together, and then I did the same thing as I did at the top, and we found, in red, the R squared value, the correlation was 0.92. In other words, this told me that in this patient, they've got enlarged ventricles, and the, it, it, it dictates completely, the ventricle size is very closely matched with the flow in the aqueduct of Sylvius. But what's changed in this is a phase shift. It's happening at a different time. So that means the whole of the inter intracranial hydrodynamic system has changed. It's gone out of tune. Something's changed in there. The compliance has changed. Something's changed about the tissue. Something's changed about the whole system. I then because I had the data sets and I like playing with MATLAB. And uh, just to give you an idea, I was up at five in the morning yesterday, uh, the geek that I am, because I couldn't, when I woke up, I kept thinking about this and I just wanted to run this through a MATLAB uh, program to see what I'd got. And, 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 and surprisingly, I actually enjoy it. That's the worst bit about, that's the saddest bit about my thing. I, you know, engineers need a social life. We always had difficulty getting girlfriends, so you can tell. But uh, um, it doesn't change. Um, and people say to me, stop talking about work. Well, I actually enjoy what I do, so, you know, it's just how it is. Look, these are two, the only two complete data sets where I've got cervical flow and aqueductal flow. The El Sankari data set is actually a composite of 19 healthy individuals. And you can see the same shape when you put a phase plane diagram between the aqueductal flow and the, and the cervical flow, the cere cerebrospinal fluid. You can see the same shape. What you see also is that when the aqueductal flow increases, so the cervical flow increases. So that's hinting very strongly that there's a relationship, the driving force is the cervical cerebrospinal fluid flow that has been driven by the change in the blood volumes, which includes the, uh, the venous blood volume, and it's all coming down to the aqueductal flow, and that may be having an effect on Another effect, kind of like a pincer movement coming around onto the ventricle size. I don't really understand fully what's going on there, but I would like to know. Watch this space. So the implications of this, what I can say with absolute confidence is there is a very strong relationship w between ventricle size and the flow in the aqueduct of Sylvius. What I can also say is when the two move out of phase, then something has changed in the whole regulatory system, and that's something that people should be looking for. And there seems to be a general relationship between the flow of the cerebrospinal fluid and the aqueductal flow, although we don't really understand it. Well, I think I'm only going to say the same things as I had before. What I'm saying here is that as you get venous hypertension, then you get changes, certainly in the bolt flow, of the cerebrospinal fluid moving into the sagittal sinus. The suggestion being that it slows down is that the intracranial pressure has not increased dramatically. But we can also see that if the pulsatility has changed, that's going to have an effect on the cortical bridging veins. Think about it. If, they've got if they're 
hypertensive, in other words, they're inflated with higher pressure, that's going to change their behavior. If the signal has changed in some way, remember, if these things have inflated, then that changes the characteristics of the difference between the arterial and venous blood volumes, will change the characteristics of the cerebrospinal fluid. Everything changes, and who knows, it might be allowing a more pulsatile flow through the vascular bed, which may account for other things. So this whole thing is linked. Again, it's all pointing to lesions forming in certain locations that we've discussed before. So my conclusions are, quite simply, that the stenosis will, and the venous hypertension arising from that, will change the whole regulatory system, and that this will change characteristics that we just haven't even thought about yet. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you.